I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. So I'm on vacation with my wife and my children. We're on a beach at Crescent City, California, leisurely competing with each other. It's just an innocent game of hunting for sand dollars. And in the middle of that, I stop and I gaze at the horizon over the Pacific, and I have this sudden rush of terror. I allow myself to have this sudden rush of terror. It's just, just thinking about the vastness of the sea, the danger of the ocean. You may have forgotten this, but Crescent City was hit by an eight-foot tsunami as recently as 2011. Several tsunamis in the area, actually. Tsunami warning signs everywhere. Uh, this was triggered by that same earthquake that took out the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. And there I stood on the site of... What for us locally was a bit of a a, a disaster. Yes, the harbor destroyed. Violence of a sort. The ocean is mighty and it's going to claim what it will. But the story of the violence of the ocean is not just about what nature can wreak. A lethal tsunami, you could say it's just following the laws of nature. And by contrast, the lawlessness of the high seas is a human phenomenon. We have a a standard paradigm for this. It's the Hollywood framing of the Wild West. You've got the perils of trying to survive in an inhospitable desert landscape. And all of that danger is just intensified once you're looking down the barrel of an outlaw's gun, right? Uh, The bullet could get you too. And of all the places on earth today where scofflaw behavior is rampant, where society seems ungoverned, ungovernable, where the norms of civility are routinely flouted, in brutal and gruesome ways often, well, just think to yourself, how much of the planet is covered with water? And uh, who's looking out over that water with any kind of jurisdiction? What national entities might be policing it? Is it impossible to police the oceans? How expensive would it be? And so there I'm standing, the salt spray on my face in Crescent City. What should I have feared the most? I actually stood there taking a little time, thinking about jellyfish and sharks and hurricanes and freak waves, tsunamis even. I did not think about the violence of fellow humans. We have with us a researcher and a writer who can address the latter, the violence of humans on the high seas. And I think this conversation is going to get much deeper into the subject than just a few brief headlines about Somali pirates. That's what often will reach us, just that sort of thing. A big problem but I think it's just a little sliver of the total picture. Ian Urbina is with us, a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter with the New York Times. He's a contributing writer for The Atlantic. His book, The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier, deals with crimes offshore, slavery on the high seas, illegal fishing, gun running, violence towards stowaways, and the apparent impunity of it all. Ian Urbina, uh, we think we've got you on the line with us. Are you there? I'm here. Thank you so much for coming on to our show. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Likewise. Now, knowing what you know, is there any empathy you can even have for a little family like mine and my innocence? I'm naively walking along and I'm thinking of the ocean as a relatively safe place, at least, to be traveling on, except for nature. Nature can get me. Am I, am I just the typical naive person you encounter who doesn't know about the dangers of uh, lawlessness on the seas? I think you're typical, but not naive. I think most of us, myself included, um, you know, have this experience with the ocean, which is a fairly tranquil one. And, you know, kind of we enjoy the luxury of the beauty of it all. And and, um, I think that's the norm. I think um, partially because we operate in on the coast and or in national waters and far away from where the really bad stuff tends to happen. So I wouldn't say it's naive by any means, um, uh, but ideally the book aimed to bring to the public awareness a a little more connection with all the bad stuff that's happening out there as well. Now, uh, I want to talk about, I want to get into a story right away, the the story of a, a ship called the Thunder, because this is, I think, a story from your book that really does exemplify uh, the craziness of what happens out on the seas. Uh, tell us about the Thunder. Yes, like you say, it's, a, it's an epic tale. Uh, the Thunder was, at the time, the most wanted illegal fishing vessel on the planet. It earned that status uh, via Interpol, which keeps a list called the Purple List. The Purple List is a sort of bad boy list that um, at the time only had about eight or nine ships on it. 
And you have to work pretty hard to get on that list. And essentially, it's an arrest on fight, you know, international list. And if these vessels come into your port anywhere in the world, you're supposed to detain them. Um, in the case of the Thunder, it had top billing on that list because it had been engaged in illegal fishing in the Antarctic uh, for close to a decade and sort of had racked up over $60 million in profits in, in that process, primarily fishing for something called toothfish um, or Patagonian um, or Chilean sea bass is what you'll you'll see it on restaurant menus as. And um, this conservation uh, ocean conservation group um, that describe themselves as vigilantes um, called Sea Shepherd, uh, which has a fleet of vessels around the world, decided they were going to find and chase the thunder and um, not ram it and not attempt to actually board it and you know make a citizen's arrest, but rather to just trail it and um, every time if they could find it, um, uh, and follow it, and every time the thunder attempted to enter a port and offload its ill-gotten gain, its illicit catch, uh, the Sea Shepherd uh, advocates were going to raise a lot of um, uh, notice and contact the press, etc. And in some ways, the mission was to shame both the thunder, but also the governments that, for nearly a decade, had failed to enforce the law that was on the books um, and stopped this ship. And indeed, Sea Shepherd succeeded in finding the thunder net in the water, in Antarctic waters, and uh, thus began this um, grand chase in which the two Sea Shepherd ships followed the thunder for 110 days and tens of thousands of miles from the Antarctic up to the coast of Africa, you know, through hellish storms and, and iceberg, dangerous iceberg fields and you know, um, uh, and um, ultimately the Thunder's captain sank his own ship uh, after evacuating his own crew uh, as a means of um, getting rid of the evidence that might result in a heavier prosecution. Uh, and the Sea Shepherd folks uh, rescued those folks in the water and delivered them over to the police, and they were prosecuted and jailed. Now, the sinking of the scuttling of the ship, this is from what I understand from your writing, this is a pretty common thing that out on the ocean, if you don't want to be prosecuted, if you want to destroy the evidence, it's easy to do. Yeah, you know, as a crime scene, the ocean's a funny place. You know, so I'm told by ocean investigators and, and marine police, you know, because there are no, there are very few witnesses. Uh, there are no cameras typically out there, um, except for usually in the hands of the folks doing the bad acting. Um, uh, you know, there are no skid marks on the road, if you will. Um, and then if you're really at risk of being caught um, with potential evidence, meaning blood on the deck or um, illegal nets or what, what have you, it's sometimes cheaper just to scuttle the ship. And um, it's, it's not, it's fairly unusual. I mean, the thing about the outlaw ocean or about the high seas in general is that there are very few police out there anyway, right? So the lawlessness and the impunity is largely a result of a lack of enforcement of laws. Um, but in the rare cases where there are police and, and the even rarer cases when they do something about it, um, there is always the option of getting rid of the evidence by um, deep fixing your vessel. And deep sixing, meaning maybe 6,000 feet down or more, yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly, wrong metaphor. <laughs> so I, I want to know uh, uh, about the range of crimes that that happen on the high seas, I know you've categorized them into several of the of the, the biggest categories. Uh, would you run that through for us? Yeah, I mean, one of the ambitions of the of the reporting um, was to broaden uh, the public awareness of what happens out there. You know, typically people, if I if I said I was working on maritime crime, you know. People might think of, like you say, Somali piracy or Captain Phillips, the movie, or, or the BP spill. And having worked out in the space, I knew there was a lot more going on. And I also wanted to look I, – I knew there was a lot of attention on the above, the below the waterline crimes, so the environmental crimes, um, ocean plastic and, and um, rising of sea temperature and uh, illegal fishing and overfishing, et cetera. Um, but I was also really interested in looking at the above the 
sea lion crimes, so the ones against the fishers, not just against the fish. And so, all, you know, those were the overall goals. Um, you know, the, the diversity of so, so the book ends up being 50 percent about human rights and labor crimes and 50 percent about environmental. Um, in terms of what happens out there, as you said before, murder of stowaways, um, uh, intentional dumping of oil rather than just spills. You know, every three years there's more oil dumped intentionally by ships in, into the oceans than the BP spill and the Exxon Valdez spill combined. Um, you know, blast fishing, using dynamite to, to, um, to fish, uh, um, uh, arms trafficking, uh, murder. We, there was one – murder is actually surprisingly – I wouldn't say common but frequent um, – you know, when the UN interviewed deckhands in the South China Sea, Cambodian workers on fishing vessels off the coast of Thailand, for example, um, 50 percent of them said they had witnessed firsthand murder of crew. Um, so murder, arms trafficking, sea slavery uh, is a term uh, that refers to this problem in which uh, workers on fishing vessels, usually long haul fishing vessels, mostly in foreign waters or high seas, are either – physically, you know, um, uh, kept on board in shackles or kept on board through mechanisms like debt bondage. You know, they have a debt to pay off and they're not allowed to leave the ship for two years until that debt has been, that debt has been cleared. Um, so, so that's a little bit of a sense of um, the range of, of crimes. There's also, you know, all sorts of extra legal, it's called the outlaw ocean rather than the illegal ocean in the sense that there are folks out there who are operating outside the bounds of the law for what they believe are, and, and many might agree, are, are sort of higher goods. And Sea Shepherd's a perfect example. They're engaged in um, illegal or extra-legal behavior for the sake of protecting um, the environment. Uh, and so there, there are a fair number of actors um, who are operating in that gray area. We did a story about um, repo men and the business of stealing ships, oftentimes on behalf of banks or mortgage lenders, um, and that's in a very real gray area of the law as to whether the people who are engaged in repossessing ships that have debt on them uh, and, and, and secreting them to another country's port, whether that's legal or illegal, is, um, you know, depends on who you ask. So here you are, an investigative reporter, and I would imagine the lines, uh, uh, well, the, the line of work you do and the, the types of stories you've covered, you've got to have a, well, I'm just going to call you intrepid you know that it, it, to me you've gone places where i think you shouldn't have gone physically where you were in danger right yeah i mean i i'm always a little yes i think it's the honest answer is yes um the asterisk i'll put on it is you know any place i've gone or any danger i've seen i'm always you know sort of pales in comparison to the danger faced by the people i'm reporting on so it feels a little icky sometimes to focus on the danger i was exposed to when i think about Either number one, the people I brought with me are typically from the country, and they have to go back to the country where the story will run. And I get on a plane and come back to the U.S. where I'm somewhat untouchable. And those folks have to live in those villages and, and coastal communities and deal with the re repercussions, and they're facing real danger from the journalism. And then the people that we're reporting about, and those are the – I'm referring to the photographers and the, and the translators and the fixers that, that come with me on these missions, and then – and then there's the people I'm reporting about, you know, these, you know, 13, 15, 16-year-old boys who are often working as deckhands, sometimes literally as slaves, and I'm writing stories about them, and they're trusting me to do so in a way that protects their anonymity, anonymity and they're, they're taking real risk, you know, on, on, on that trust uh, in me. So the dangers um, are far worse always for them. Would you explain just what is the predicament of a stowaway? Why a stowaway is in such peril uh, for having gotten onto a vessel in a very secretive way, and suddenly they're out on the high seas and they're found? What is what's at stake there? You know, so stowaways are an institution, you know, sort of hobos of the sea that go back centuries. But post nine eleven, um, the world changed, and and the sort of legitimate fear that emerged after 9-11 um, had uh, in one of its uh, consequences um, the implementation of 
new and pretty restrictive rules on ports around the world. So those rules had to do with if you show if you're a ship captain, be it a merchant vessel, you know, cargo ship or fuel tanker or a fishing boat, and if you show up in port and you have folks on board who aren't on your manifest, uh, aren't registered, they're stowaways or um, the penalties you face are very severe, and they went up significantly after 9/11, and that and their financial penalties typically, and that um, has had a sort of perverse effect in which um, the fishing companies that have to pay those fines turn to the fishing captains and say, hey, look, if we get hit with those fines, you're, it's coming out of your salary, and the fishing boat captain turns to his officers and says the same thing. If, if, if we leave port here and arrive to our next port and it turns out we have a stowaway on board, um, that's on you and you guys are going to pay the penalty. And the penalties are the equivalent of a year's salary for some of these guys. So, so the stakes get really high. What that has meant is that um, the, when the, the crew sweeps the vessel and doesn't find the stowaways and then the stowaways appear you know, halfway through the voyage, Sometimes those stowaways are are uh, disappeared. Uh, they're more likely to be disappeared, or what's called rafted, which is the case that we uh, that I told a story about. Um, which is rather than killing them outright and throwing them overboard, they build some makeshift raft in the middle of the ocean, far away from land authorities, and they put the stowaways on the raft and they cut them loose. And they feel a little bit better because they haven't, you know, sort of directly killed them, uh, but they also don't. Uh, arrive into national waters and um, have to pay penalties for having had them on board. Um, and this is some the, the sort of brutality of how the stowaways are dealt uh, with um, really uh, got worse after 9-11, and that was the story we sought to tell. Now, you mentioned the post-9-11 situation in which we find ourselves where regulations have changed and these fines have increased. There's another aspect since 9-11 uh, on the high seas it has to do with gun running uh, and and how that has shifted the regulation of guns, the presence of guns. Uh, what is this private uh, security industry that has cropped up wrong metaphor again uh, on the on the oceans uh, a maritime private security industry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so two things came together there. One was the Somali piracy phenomena, which really peaked in two thousand and eight and for the first time in maritime history and history period, um, government said, look, we can't really deal with these guys. So we're turning to you, the shipping industry, both the merchant, especially the merchant industry, but also the fishing industry. And you guys are now authorized to hire private security and bring them on board. And historically, governments didn't like to do that because they like to sort of keep a monopoly on weaponry and not have folks arming themselves at sea because it would lead to clashes that could end up in geopolitical um, crisis. Uh, but in this moment in Somali piracy, they said, look, you guys hire private and you handle this on your own. So thus, literally overnight, a, a multi-billion dollar industry of private maritime security guards, many of them ex you know, um, soldiers who serve a couple duties in Iraq or Afghanistan um, ended up um, being put on these ships uh, in the really dangerous areas. Then 9-11, the other sort of phenomena um, that gave rise to tight restrictions on any guys with guns entering your national waters, foreigners with guns who, who haven't been specifically approved by that government, those restrictions went up. So you had a problem, right? So if you're a merchant, you know, if you're a Maersk ship and you have, um, you know, containers of cargo and you have a private maritime security team on board of four armed ex-soldiers um, protecting you and you made it through the dangerous area and now you're about to enter port and you need to drop off your cargo, but you can't enter X country's waters with armed jet folks. What do you do with them? So thus, emerge these strange things called floating armories. And they're these little, not so little, um, they're these boats that have been converted into both an arms depot and a bunkhouse. And they sit right one mile outside of natural waters. Uh, so usually, you know, at the at the 200 mile mark, uh, this is 201 mile mark, and they'll sit out there. And um, when the ship comes by, they'll drop off the ship the cargo ship or the fishing ship will drop off the armed guys and they stay on these um, floating armories 
until their next deployment. Uh, either that same ship picks them up when, when they head back out or a different, they get assigned to a different ship. So these strange floating hotels with lots of guns and lots of arms and lots of um, restless uh, soldiers, um, private soldiers, um, are a very recent um, phenomena. And, um, and they, they make sense from a practical point of view, but they also are really problematic um, from a security point of view in that you've got um, uh, you know, a number of reasons. You've got a, a, a huge cache of arms uh, that's not super protected floating out there where um, reinforcements are few and far between and you know, sort of easy targets for um, uh, folks, militants to hit. And, and, and you also have um, guards who are stuck out there waiting for long periods of time extremely restless um, uh, uh, and sort of living this very strange life. Um, and then just the, the maritime security industry in general emerged faster than laws did. And so the rules on if someone kills someone at sea on the high seas, um, who investigates and uh, who determines and how do they determine whether that killing was legitimate? You know, was that really a pirate or was that a migrant that you thought was a pirate? Um, uh, th these sorts of questions are, are, are very real, and the law um, and the enforcement of that law is really murky. Our guest right now on Constant Wonder is Ian Urbina. He's an investigative reporter for The New York Times. He has a book out titled The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. In just a moment, maybe two minutes or so, I, I want to connect this story of the crimes on the seas with how it even really touches on my own personal life. Before I get to that, though, I I'm interested in knowing your view of where the human tragedy is at its greatest in terms of scope. Where, where's the greatest suffering happening? On what types of vessels in what type of maritime situation or industry? I would say the long-haul fishing vessels, um, for example, Taiwanese tuna longliners. So these are ships that usually have maybe 30 to 40 crew, uh, and they, they, they're at sea for a really long period, a typical um, uh, corridor would be Montevideo, Uruguay, to Cape Town, South Africa. There's a big, you know, bunch of ships that run that corridor. Those ships are really decrepit. Um, uh, they depend on um, f developing world crew. Many of them are illiterate. Many of them are debt bonded. Um, violence is very common. Beatings and worse uh, on these ships from. Uh, captains on the deckhands, um, and so just the the conditions, the working conditions are, are brutal. Twenty hour days, six seven days a week. Um, so so I would say that those are by far the toughest ships I've seen. And the two lingering things on my mind, I just absolutely must ask you. Of course, what can be done about this is one of them. But first, does this intersect with my own life? I mean, I think it intersects with all of our lives in the sense that we all benefit to some degree from this lawlessness. You know, that one of the reasons that things are so cheap, you know, um, 90 percent of everything we consume comes by way of ship. Right. So, you know, iPhones and tennis shoes and T-shirts and uh, and shrimp and calamari, you know, it's, it's all coming from the sea and or across the sea. And uh, the global economy um the decentralized way that stuff gets to us and our out of sight, out of mind reality with our relationship with those products is one in which um, the, the bad things that are happening, be it taking fish from places they shouldn't or in ways they shouldn't or doing things to the crew that really are unethical um, are part of a, generally speaking, uh, they're not driven by evil as much as a desire to cut costs uh, and um, compete uh, and um, so I think uh, to the extent that we're all benefiting from the dollar fifty can of tuna that couldn't possibly actually only cost a dollar fifty to have gotten to our shelf um, uh, or, um, you know, products made in a week and a half later, um, you know, on the store shelf. I, I think um, we all are complicit for that reason. What's to be done? I mean, to some degree, there's no single answer to that when it comes to the outlaw ocean generally, because what's to be done about private maritime security and accountability versus murder or stowaway or sea slavery or ocean plastic are different 
answers, right? These are very different policy issues. But I do think um, one thing that could be done is, um, and, and this isn't a consumer level solution, um, but um, part of the reason this, this happens is that uh, there's there are very few requirements on fishing vessels, especially to report where they get stuff, who got it, how they got it, how long it took, you know, what route did they follow? How did that item move from one ship to another? So supply, it's often called supply chain accountability or transparency. If you, if you turn to a uh, airplane pilot, you know, and say, so, um, you know, you, you call the head, the airport you're landing in knows you're coming. We're going to see you in route. You, you've declared your cargo on board. We know who's riding with you. Your crew manifest is clear, right? The pilot would say yes, especially post 9-11. If you ask the same questions of a long haul fishing boat captain in most places in the world, they would look at you like you were crazy to even ask them that question. And so there's a real culture around long haul fishing of exception where they don't have to really report anything they're doing to anyone. And I think until that changes, we're going to have a tough time imposing laws on, on, on this space. And in everything you just said, what I took away, and you're going to have to tell me if I'm hearing you right, is mm-hmm. that the solution to minimize human suffering, the abuse, the exploitation of underage workers, this is like human trafficking and murder can be involved. The, the solution to minimize that suffering is there's got to be some better policing and regulation. Yeah, I think, I think that's, yes. I think that's right, but I think it's also not just on the governments. I think it's also, and maybe even more so, on on the suppliers, the companies. So governments move slow, and they're hemmed in by geopolitics. You can't force a different government to do something. But if if a large purchaser, be it Walmart, just as an example, decided, or fresh, you know, fresh fields, or some huge buyer of a thing, shrimp, calamari, hey, look, we're no longer going to buy any shrimp from anyone in the world unless it comes with these um, things established. The supply chain that, got, that, that gives us the shrimp has to comply with these things. It only, you know, um, if, if those sellers of the products decided to impose those sorts of rules on their own supply chain, change would come very fast, um, much faster in, in my view than if tomorrow the United States is hey, we want to end sea slavery, you know, good luck with that. But if a, a major seller of a certain, of tuna, you know, said we're, we're going to try to lead the pack in ethics and we're going to change our supply chain in this way, the market would respond and then other um, buyers likely would follow. And a lot of the ships out there would say, oh, well, if we're going to have to do this anyway to, comp- to sell to those folks, then we might as well just start doing it across the board because we don't want to have two sets of books and two sets of ships and all that. And I think that would provide additional pressure. You know, it seems like we went after this story and the the subject matter of your book because of the simple reason that the ocean is a huge percentage of this planet. And for, for this lawlessness to be in, in so many places across the high seas and, and for us to be, for the most part, most of us fairly oblivious to it. This is the kind of story that we need to hear, and I'm just delighted that we had a chance to catch up with you. It's a sad story. It involves human tragedy, but a very important one. Ian Urbina, pleasure to be with you. Thanks for being on our program. Thank you for having me. Ian Urbina, an investigative reporter for The New York Times, the book that we've been talking about, his book titled The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier.